Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, Annabelles, and Old Perfume Tea Dogs. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. Hello, Chick. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been getting some of the funniest emails since I brought that up, where it's just like the subject line is like, tell the chick to shut up. And then you open it, and it's like, JK. <laughs> uh, we are. I in- love you guys. I love you guys so much. You've been <laughs> killing me. Somebody was like, tell her to be subservient. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. from time. So I know. I've been, it's I've been complaining so funny. a lot about you. Well, you know. Us, just us won't Polish, submit. Yeah, well, Polish monsters tend not to do that. <laughs> We're into December with this episode. <laughs> Less than a month left in 2023. That's insane. Mm-hmm. Almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century. Holy shit balls. Yep. Yeah, it's wild. Wow. Cool and interesting. Uh, thanks to all the creeps and peepers leaving ratings and reviews lately. They do help us so much. Uh, keep them coming. Keep the, keep the good ones coming. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, you and- can take your bad ones somewhere else. <laughs> And how many stories does the chick have for us today, sweet Lulu? <laughs> this broad has one, yeah, well, you know. Oof. This broad. What's this broad. It? I should just shut up now. <laughs> I have one long story. Okay. It's a really good haunted house story. Ooh, I love I, those. I, love I know those. you do. I'm back. To I'm, my... I'm here to serve you. <laughs> good. Finally, some, some, some subservience. Um, I'm back to my standard two. Back to a more traditional episode this week. My first tale revolves around a demonic attachment. And my second deals with ghosts connected to a tragic past. And that's all I'm going to give away. Sorry, guys. On Time Suck, Dan just did this episode about um, the Cleveland uh, kidnappings, like Ariel Castro. Yeah. And him and Tyler and Logan, there's just this like remix of this song. And now it's in my head. And I can't dead tell. Giveaway. Like, dead giveaway. <laughs> dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. <laughs> we ain't ribs with this dude. <laughs> it could only be better if he came out with like a, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you ready uh, to show your socks? Oh, God, I'm sorry. Yes, I have to really focus because I can't get that song out of my head. (laughs) Now, these are very cute socks, but also from Mm -hmm. the bottom, they are hilarious. If you, wait, Lindsay, turn your feet. If you can read this, tell me more scary stories. This whole sock situation, it feels like a slow play into an OnlyFans account. Well, you know I have a wiki feet, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I know about wiki feet. (laughs) Well, I didn't start it. Somebody yeah. else did it. I don't know. Okay, let's take a vote. Should Lindsay have an OnlyFans with just her feet? I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it just for fucking fun. <laughs> Actually, I'll do it. Oh, if you God. guys support it, I'll do it. Oh, and then God. we'll just donate the money. Okay, that would be, you said it. Okay. You, you heard it here. I'll run a poll on Patreon. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. Here we 2025 go. 2025 or 24 is going to be real interesting. <laughs> no setup. No setup for this first one. If you're ready, we're just going to get right into it. Go, bro. Time now for the tale of the darkness finally awakens. Joy was a registered nurse, living with her husband, who worked as a welder for a large refrigeration company and their three young daughters. In the fall of 2010, she was in the basement of her home in Louisiana, looking for an old suitcase. While sifting through stacks of boxes and piles of her family's junk, she started to feel something watching her. She looked around to see if maybe her husband or one of their girls had followed her downstairs, but saw no one. She resumed her search, but then stopped again when she heard footsteps. The sound was so clear, it was obviously originating from the same room. Looking around once more, still, she saw no one. She shrugged it all off as her mind playing tricks on her, found her suitcase, left the basement, and pretty soon, she forgot about it all. And for a few months, nothing else eerie or upsetting would happen. Then on the 23rd of November, 2010, some of Joy's co-workers organized a trip to a haunted plantation in Mount Hermon, just a few miles from the Mississippi border. Joy's husband worked away from home a lot, and she felt very rarely got the chance to do fun things away from home or work, so she agreed to go. Although she didn't really believe in ghosts, she was still excited to try something new, and she ended up thoroughly enjoying the trip. They took a tour of the beautiful old estate and learned a lot about the plantation's tragic history. It was sad. It was terrible but also interesting. The house was built in 1804, once sat on some 200 acres of land, a massive piece of property 
The house was full of numerous beautiful antiques and a lot of original furniture. Joy and her co-workers were told on the tour that the man who had the house built was a colonel and that his spirit was very much still active in the house and around the grounds. While the history part was, again, interesting, neither Joy nor anyone else on their tour experienced anything out of the ordinary, which initially reconfirmed Joy's lack of belief in the supernatural. Once back home, Joy's husband let her know that something had come up quickly and he'd be out of town for work the very next week. He was leaving the very next day. Or sorry, he'd be out of town for a week, leaving the very next day. Before he hit the road again, Joy wanted to show him all the photos she had taken on that tour of the plantation. And then one of the photos, Joy saw something upsetting in the corner of a mantelpiece, a face, an old, stern-looking face with beady eyes and a beard. She immediately flashed on the supposed ghost of the colonel. Her husband claimed he couldn't see anything, though, no matter how hard he looked. Joy couldn't stop seeing it. How odd. If anything, the more she looked, the clearer the image became for her. While she still wasn't convinced, what she was looking at was indeed the ghost of the plantation. She also found it hard to put it out of her mind and could not stop thinking about it. The next day, while her husband was out of town, Joy took a nap after her shift before the girls were due home from school. And she didn't sleep long. She was woken by what sounded like someone walking around downstairs. Wondering if her husband had perhaps forgotten something and had to come back home and grab it, she got herself out of bed and went down to look. She called out, but no one answered. She looked around, but no one was there. However, she felt just like she had previously in the basement, as if someone were watching her, and she couldn't shake that feeling. Then she saw the light in one of the rooms she had just looked in start to flash on and off rapidly. As soon as she moved back towards the room, the light turned off and stayed off. Joy was now overcome by the feeling of a strange kind of pressure on her body. It was as if she was deep underwater, the weight of all the heavy liquid above threatening to crush her. The air itself felt heavy like that. It was hard to breathe. She froze, focused on her breathing, tried to talk herself down and not panic, and soon the pressure relented, and while Joy was still spooked, the house around her at least felt normal again. Did she just have a panic attack, or was it something else? A few days later, after not experiencing anything else strange or worrisome, Joy's husband returned home. It was a Friday night, and the couple were in the living room after just putting the girls to bed, about to relax together and watch a movie. Joy heard her youngest daughter's voice and went to check on her and tell her to go to sleep. When she'd made it, she got uh, when she'd made it to out. Uh, oh my God, sorry, when she'd made it to go outside the young girl's room or made it outside the young girl's room, she could clearly hear a one-sided conversation between her daughter and someone who was not there. Who are you talking to? Joy asked as she entered. The man. The little girl answered nonchalantly. Joy shivered. The man? And then her daughter casually pointed to the corner of the room. Looking towards the corner and ready to scream, Joy was relieved to not see anyone. But still, she felt very uneasy. After saying goodnight, she stepped outside her daughter's bedroom and closed the door. But then she heard something unsettling. Her daughter started singing an eerie, young child's make-it-up-as-you-go-along song about the lights turning out and not wanting the lights to turn out because then the scary man would stay with her and not leave her alone. Joy couldn't handle it. Her little girls were trying so hard to be brave and strong and not bother her parents, but she, as she sung, her daughter's voice was filled with so much fear and sadness and it broke Joy's heart and scared her. She flung the door back open, went back into her daughter's room, scooped up her child into her arms and took her to sleep with her in her bed. Even though she herself hadn't seen anything, she didn't think her daughter had just imagined that man. Something strange, maybe even sinister, was going on in their home. And in her gut, she thought it had something to do with the face in the photograph she'd taken at the plantation, the colonel. She became obsessed with that photo and now started to take pictures all around her house, especially if a room felt off in any way. She was hoping to capture the face again. Then maybe her husband would see it. Maybe the two of them could figure out for sure what seeing the face meant, what it wanted, how to get rid of it. But she could never capture it and photograph again. For several days, nothing new and noteworthy occurred. But then one night, Joy and her husband were sleeping when their bed suddenly began to violently shake. Still half asleep, scared and confused, Joy shot up like a bolt and sat upright. And that's when she truly saw him for the first time. She wasn't able to photograph him, but there he was, the face from the photo, the man in the corner of her daughter's room. There at the foot of her bed stood a dark figure, almost solid black, though she could still make out a few features such as a stern face and a beard. Suddenly, an unforeseen force threw her back down on the bed, and she felt an intense pressure circle around her throat. 
Once again, it was hard to breathe. Something was choking her. Her husband now woke also, and as she started squirming around on the bed and gasping for air, her husband did the first thing that came into his head, and not being able to see any entity harming her, started to pray over his wife. He demanded whatever was harming her to let her go. Incredibly, it worked, and Joy was released. She choked and sputtered a bit, but she could breathe again. The dark entity she had seen at the foot of her bed was gone. The air around her had returned to feeling normal, and she didn't feel anything touching her or watching her. But she was still, understandably, absolutely terrified. And now her husband was also scared, but for different reasons. He hadn't seen anything and was more worried about his wife's mental health than he was about the possibility of some ghost. Adding to both of their terror, Joy's husband was due to leave for a few days again in the morning. Would she be okay? After he and Joy both woke up a little after sunrise, she set up the living room for her and her daughters to all sleep in together. She didn't want to leave any of the children alone with whatever this entity was. She prayed continually throughout the day for God to protect her and her family from whatever this thing was. While her husband was out of town, Joy tried to reach out to a few local pastors in the area. Although it seemed like they did believe her, none of them would agree to come visit and bless her house. She couldn't tell if they just didn't know how to help, or scared, or maybe really thought she was imagining it all. She felt lost and alone in addition to still, fe still feeling terrified. She had no idea what to do, but knew she had to do something. The first night her husband was gone while laying on the couch in the living room with her girls, her oldest screamed out of nowhere as if she'd been hurt and then showed her mom her arm where she said she could feel a burning pain. Joy rolled up the sleeve of her daughter's pajamas and couldn't believe her eyes when she saw scratched into her daughter's skin an upside down cross with a pitchfork above it. Her fear now turned to anger and Joy began to shout at the spirit demanding it to leave her home. This accomplished nothing other than seeming to enrage the spirit. For Joy was now thrown to the ground and then dragged across the floor before being released. While she could now no longer feel the thing touching her, she also knew it was still nearby, watching her, enjoying its torment of her and the children. At her wit's end, Joy ordered the children to run out to the car, planning on taking them to stay the night at a hotel. However, sadly, Joy would soon learn that escaping this thing would not be nearly that easy. It wasn't attached to her house, it was attached to her. About five minutes into the drive, Joy looked into the rearview mirror, and there, staring back at her, was the dark, stern face with the beady eyes and the beard. Again, she assumed it was the colonel. She screamed out and nearly wrecked the car before pulling over to calm down before driving further. The face, thankfully, was now gone. Once she was able to get not just herself calmed down, but also her kids, she turned the car around and, feeling defeated and realizing that they wouldn't be safe anywhere they went, she drove back home. After barely sleeping that night, she again reached out to various religious leaders in the area the following morning. She finally spoke to a woman known as Reverend Solaria, and she agreed to visit her in her home that same day. After arriving and being greeted at the front door, the Reverend said she could feel evil as soon as she entered the house. The atmosphere was heavy and uneasy. She told Joy that the only way to get rid of the malevolent and possibly demonic spirit was through faith, that only God could save her and her family from torment. She blessed the house and prayed for hours, and then eventually the atmosphere felt lighter and lighter, and finally, it felt good and safe to be in her home. Joy truly believed the spirit had been banished. She prayed every day for the following se uh, several months, begging God to keep the man from returning, and for months, it was gone, or at least it was quiet. But then out of nowhere, it returned. One night after the family had shared dinner together, Joy's husband asked their oldest daughter to clear the table. And this simple, harmless request sent the normally agreeable and helpful girl into a fit of inexplicable rage. She physically attacked her father, pushing him to the ground, and then to the horror of all present, she lifted the heavy dining room table and threw it across the room into the wall as if it were a child's toy. As the rest of the family stared in disbelief, a voice that didn't belong to the child came from her mouth, screaming, This is my house! Joy grabbed her daughter, started praying loudly until her little girl's body went limp and she lost consciousness. She came to a few moments later, claiming no memory at all of what she'd just done. Desperate once again, Joy did some quick searching on the computer and found the phone number for a man named Jeremy Leonard, a local paranormal expert and investigator. Jeremy came as soon as he could, within just a few days, to meet with the family, inspect the house, and investigate their claims. When he initially walked around the home, he said he could feel the uncomfortable atmosphere Joy had told him about, and his EMF meter was going crazy. And then he saw him. Standing in the bathroom doorway, he laid his eyes on a tall, dark figure with a stern face. 
Immediately, Jeremy was convinced that this entity was not a human spirit. It was not some ghost from the plantation. It was demonic. He promised Joy and her family he would return soon with help. He wouldn't be able to cleanse their home with this thing alone, but felt like he knew who could. Took a couple of weeks, but he was good on his word and returned with the minister. The minister also believed that this entity was demonic. He did not think Joy had brought it back from the plantation. He believed it was already with Joy before she visited. He asked her if she'd ever practiced witchcraft or used a Ouija board. She hadn't. She definitely had not. Joy had been raised in the church and her faith had never wavered. Still, the minister was adamant that something in her past must have opened the door to let this entity in and that it, re- and that it had remained dormant or virtually dormant until just recently. It was waiting for her mind and spirit to be troubled before truly manifesting. The minister wondered if her trip to the plantation, going over all of the history of human suffering there, possibly wondering how a just, caring God could have let any of that happen. That experience may have made her doubt her faith more than she was willing to admit. Joy suddenly flashed back to a very strange event from when she was just 20 years old and doing missionary work in rural Honduras. She'd gone to meet some indigenous people in a small, remote village. Before the villagers were comfortable letting her speak about her god, they had insisted on performing some type of ritual she didn't fully understand. They'd bound her wrists and feet, each put a thumbprint of their own blood on her forehead. The minister now had Joy gather together everything she still owned from her time spent on that mission. He was convinced that during that ritual, that was when some dark entity had attached itself to something she brought home. Joy did as she was asked, and then together in her backyard garden, they set fire to her collection of items. Almost as soon as the burning began, Joy fainted. On the ground, she began to convulse and squirm, crying out as if in pain. Jeremy and the minister took hold of her and prayed over her while the items kept burning, and then it was over. When all those items were reduced to nothing but ashes, Joy felt a huge weight suddenly lift from her. She felt like she had before it had all began, no better, better and lighter than she'd felt in years. Her home once again felt fresh and airy. The minister's instincts seemed to have been correct. His remedy had worked and going forward, at least as of March of 2017 when her story was first publicly told, Joy and her family never again had experienced anything else out of the ordinary. Whatever had been attached to her had been released, cast back into the void from whence it came. That's good detective work. Mm Mm-hmm. It's impressive. Yeah. Because like, why would you, I mean, it would take so much effort for you to like, Think that. Mm-hmm. Think like to, like to not think 20, it was a ghost. 25 and, years ago, whatever it was. It's like, what? Yeah, yeah. That's a weird ritual. I've never heard of that. I know. Who knows? Like what, yeah. I mean, I shouldn't say weird. I don't mean, I just mean it's like odd, peculiar. I've never heard well, of it you before. Know, uh, you know, people get funny about the word weird, but like uh, it just means for whatever your normal is, yeah. it's not that. Well, thank you. Yeah, so it is weird. It's weird in the sense that it's weird we're me. not familiar with those rituals. I know, but I could use other words. Yeah. I have no pics associated with this story. But, How dare you? <laughs> but when looking for pictures of an old man's ghost face, oh God. I found some cool, I think it's AI renderings of spooky faces. Oh. Raina Polsky on a site called Tensor.art is doing some really cool shit. Here, here's one of an old man she did. Whoa. I like the way that he pops out from the background and just kind of like, I don't know, the brown almost like tones of the photo. And like, there's a whole series of them. This next one is a girl sitting in front of a TV featuring uh, some woman behind her, really creepy stuff. Oh, God. Oh, somebody just sent me an email about white-eyed children. Oh, really? Uh-huh. I was like, that, oh. that seems worse than black-eyed children somehow. And then, and then the last one, uh, just a, another girl sitting in front of a TV with three girls in the TV. Her eyes are white. Their eyes seem to be dark. I love this photo. It's just, there's something really... Uh, Creepy about it. Unsettling about that. Yeah, unsettling. Like like the way the the foreground is lit and it's so shadowy in the background. It's like there's a door back there. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm like, is there something in that door? I don't think so. But like the vague shape of some entity. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it gives me the chills. Definitely. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, When you said, oh, I think it was AI. Oh, I should have wrote down this name, but you Mm -hmm. showed like the Cholulu, Cholula. I can't. Cholula is the hot sauce. Chalupa? No, you know, the like, uh, there was like a creature, the creature guy, and you had like showed a Cthulhu. Ren- Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but I, when you showed it, you didn't credit the artist, and we got an email from a fan. Oh, shoot. That, you got an email from the fan that was like, A, how like rude, mm-hmm. and B, like, and I should have caught it. It's not AI, it's um, concept art. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've, like, forgot about, like, that's, like, a whole incredible thing. Like, like you know, I worked yep. on, like, a bunch of, like, Marvel DC shows. Yeah. And the artists that come in that, like, you just speak words to them and then they are like, is this what you mean? Is this what yeah. you mean? Until you get it just right. And then they take that and you work yeah. with, like, special effects and practical effects and the costume department. We have a fan who's costumes. huge in that world. And I think his handle on Instagram is Jay Morans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Ugh, I'm bad at remembering handles, but I can see yeah, his face. I can see his face, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes what'll happen on pictures, just so people know, is like, uh, I guess I should get better. Is like, I think there is some kind of thing. That I just, I, I, I'm remembering it now. That's that okay. You, we you, all make mistakes. Well, I think you can right click and do source. You can find where it first was posted. Oh. I think because uh, what will happen when I'm rushing around throwing those in, usually kind of like at the last second, right yeah, before it's the we record. Last thing you do. Yeah, yeah, last thing I do. Um, the article, like it appears in won't ne- like sometimes it'll appear in multiple places yeah and they don't credit and it they don't credit so it's like it's hard uh i don't know who yeah. did it unless unless it comes from the person's site yeah or they actually beneath the picture they credit it but i think there is a way to yeah. right click and, and find out where it first sh- showed uh, showed up yeah yeah that con- concept art is so cool okay now back to this story yeah um that's kind of fascinating about the picture that they couldn't see the same thing in the photograph. Her and her husband, uh, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that really threw me for a loop. I was pretty heavily focused on that for a while. What if someone could mess with your mind like that? To where it's like, how oh upsetting would that be? Is if you take a photo of someplace and you see like this demonic face clearly almost like becoming more vivid. Ugh. And every time you show it to people, they're like, no, it looks fine to me. Oh my God. It'd be so think- much worse than everybody being able to see it. Well, yeah, because then it, it sends you into that like, Am I having a mental breakdown uh-huh. or am I possessed? The, that like uh-huh. fine line of not knowing which is which when yeah. you're like, I go to work, I am a functioning adult, I don't understand. And it, especially when it's just in this one realm, mm-hmm. like if ever, if everything else, if you're like driving down the road, you're like, okay, but when you look at that billboard, what do you see? Okay, yeah, that's what I see. But it's just in this one photograph. Yeah. I mean, I guess process of elimination. And then I thought the symbol was weird that ended up on the kid's arm upside oh, down yeah. cross with a pitchfork. I was like, that's... It's just like some some more traditional like satanic imagery as far as, you know, like a cult imagery. I, I can... I don't know what it actually means. Yeah, like me that either. symbol, but, it, but I've heard of that symbol before and seen that symbol before. Yeah, but that's a good story. And I'm glad that the... I mean, I'm not glad that the daughter was possessed, but I'm glad that yeah. the husband was there for that moment. Yeah. Because then yeah, as soon as you have validation that you're not the only one, I can't mm-hmm. imagine like the heavy sigh of Ugh. relief. Totally. I was like, oh, thank God. I'm yeah. not totally losing it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, are you ready to leave rural northern Louisiana and head to one of my new favorite parts of the country, an area around Los Angeles? Oh, Topanga Canyon. Mm-hmm. How did I know? You guys, Dan sent me a li- <laughs> He's been sending me listings to houses that we can't afford in Topanga Canyon. They just look cool. I just- he's like, he's like, look at this. Look at this. I'm like, that's okay. Yeah, they're cool. It's a cool area. I just love that we lived there for so long. I can't believe you were never into Pinga Canyon. Never went there. I can't believe you didn't go hiking there. Like, mm. Pinga Canyon's so great. Uh. Mm, sorry, I failed you. Yeah, after spending a few days down in LA uh, appearing as a guest on several podcasts promoting this and other shows, uh, I stumbled upon Topanga Canyon. And like the subject of the story, I fell in love with it. And I immediately started searching forums on my trip to find a story set there. Funny. Just to have an excuse to talk about it. A uh, fair, fair amount of story setup. It's a little bit of a slow burn, but it gets good uh, before jumping into the paranormal aspects. What was supposed to be a dream quickly became a nightmare for my wife, Angie, and I before it thankfully became a dream again. Angie grew up in the Los Angeles area. She was born in Burbank, spent most of her childhood in Sherman Oaks, and then ended up going to school in Santa Monica High School before going to college just a few miles down the road from her parents at UCLA. I grew up in a very different place. Buffalo, New York. (laughs) I feel like Buffalo is a lot cooler than most people give it credit for being, but the weather does generally suck for four to six months out of the year, every year, if you hate the cold. And I do hate the cold and the snow. I don't ski. I don't snowboard. I don't ice fish or play hockey or even go sledding. I don't even like a snowball fight. I hate shoveling a driveway or digging a car out of the snow or driving through the snow or well, you get it. I'm not a fan. I love sunshine. I like a hot summer's day. I love palm trees and the beach. My parents took all of us to Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, Universal Studios, Laguna Beach, Hollywood, and Santa Monica on a huge family vacation when I was young. Seventh grade, I believe. And man, did Southern California leave an impression on me. So beautiful, so much to do, no snow, like ever. Mm -hmm. And of course, this would stick out in the memory of a seventh grade boy, so many gorgeous girls. 
Girls playing volleyball and bikinis on the beach, rollerblading around the promenade, cute tan girls with sun bleach hair and big white smiles. It was heaven. I knew before we headed home that someday I would live in this magical place. After not getting accepted to USC, UCLA, or Loyola Marymount, I was worried I'd have to wait a bit. But I did get accepted to UC Irvine. Not quite the same vibe, but close to LA in the same weather for sure. And after graduating, I was able to get an accounting job at Providence St. John's right in Santa Monica, less than two miles from the Third Street Promenade, the boardwalk, and the beach. And then my job led me to bumping into Angie, a super smart, gorgeous, blonde-haired, tan-skinned California girl who was about to finish her junior year at UCLA. After she graduated, she got a job as a biomedical engineer. And so we stayed in the area, an area I'd fallen in love with even more than I thought I would. Yes, the traffic sucks. Yes, it's really expensive. And yeah, maybe there are quite a few more pretentious douchebags and star fuckers in LA than there are back in Buffalo, but that weather, the food, the ocean, it can really be such an enchanting place. However, a couple years into our careers, even though we both had great jobs and no kids, we were still renting and renting and renting. First, we rented an apartment in Brentwood, then a small house in Silver Lake. Finally, after almost a full decade of renting, we'd saved up what would be a fortune in Buffalo, enough for a down payment on a palatial estate, but not enough for a nice house with a big yard in most of LA, especially closer to the beach, back towards Santa Monica, where we wanted to live, where we wanted to raise kids, have a dog, all that good stuff. So now the big question was where to buy, what could we afford, and where would we have the space we wanted? We looked at Venice, loved the bohemian feel of that place, but were worried about the crime. We looked at Studio City but felt that it's maybe a little too suburban, buttoned up. Malibu is beautiful, but too expensive. Pacific Palisades is maybe a bit too pretentious. We checked out Woodland Hills, also too expensive for what you get in the best parts or in other parts, kind of old, outdated, stuffy, and honestly, pretty ugly. But driving back from Woodland Hills, we drove through an area I'd never been in before. One Angie never even told me about. She'd forgotten about it. A hidden gem, Topanga. Set in the Santa Monica Mountains, mostly in and around Topanga Canyon, it feels in most parts like you're far from the hustle and bustle of LA, way out in the country in another world. But at the right time of day, you're within an hour's drive of Venice, LA, Hollywood, and most of the San Fernando Valley. And depending on where you are in Topanga, you can be in within a half hour of Santa Monica, Brentwood, and the Palisades, Malibu, and more. You're up in the lush, beautiful mountains, you're close to the ocean, there's a creek running through the area, tons of hiking and biking trails. And the best part, you can still buy big chunks of land, as in a few acres big. And the land was cheap enough for us to either do a custom build or find some old home that maybe Neil Young or Mick Fleetwood or Jim Morrison or Joni Mitchell may have spent time in or lived in or recorded some of the songs you've heard a thousand times in. It's a cool, artsy place. Before we both went to bed that night, we drove through the canyon. We both knew Topanga was our place. It was where we were going to buy a house and raise our kids. And a little over three months later, we had an offer accepted not too far from Trippet Ranch a little over three acres, about a half acre for the building site and surrounding area for a yard, pool, etc., and over two and a half acres of mountain and raw land to ensure we'd have privacy, an oasis for the kids and us. We could have a big dog, a couple big dogs, a pack of big dogs, (laughs) and also still be in an area where there were other kids in the neighborhood and great school options. And now you're probably starting to think, is this a ghost story or are you working for Topanga's Board of Tourism? I'm getting to the spooky stuff soon, I promise. After we bought our land for way less than we would have had, uh, would have expected to pay before looking into Topanga, now came the more expensive part, building a custom home, starting with nothing. Ugh. I mean, no driveway, no water, no sewer access, nothing. Initially, we planned on staying where we were at in Silver Lake and continuing to, continuing to rent until the place was finished, but that was going to take at least 18 months. And the commute between the two places is rough. And we loved the property so much, we didn't want to wait. We wanted to be there now. So after the driveway was paved and all the utilities were in place, we decided to be adventurous. We bought a used Airstream, had a little concrete slab with utilities connected to it, set up on a flat part of the property, and just started living there. It was fun to watch the progress being made in real time. Well, sometimes also infuriating when it seemed like no progress was being made, but mostly fun. Angie and I bought a little set of lawn furniture. And we began a nightly ritual of setting out under the stars, eating dinner, feeling the breeze blowing off the mountains and out towards the Pacific, stargazing, dreaming together, and having a cocktail or two. We'd also enjoy the smell of a few orange trees someone had planted on the property many years ago. At one point, some previous owners had a house about 30 yards from where our home was being built. The remnants of the old stone foundation is still there. And it seems like they had a garden near the house. 
and a variety of fruit trees near that. Four old orange trees were still standing when we moved in, and boy did they ever smell good. I often found my gaze drawn towards them, and one night, about a month after we'd settled into that airstream, I saw them. Time now for the tale of the girls around the orange tree. I was staring at three child-sized shadowy shapes. It was shocking. It looked like the three of them were playing ring around the rosy, spinning around. At least I think they were doing something like that. It was hard to tell because their shapes blended into the rest of the darkness and other shadows around them. I could barely speak when I tried to point out what I was watching to Angie. Baby, baby, do you see that? When she didn't respond, I turned to face her, saw that she was lost in her phone. Uh, Sorry, what? She said. I was getting back to my mom. Look over there by the orange trees. Right after I said that, I turned around and of course they were gone. So frustrating. I so badly wanted her to see them. Angie already thought I was weirdo for believing in ghosts. She had never had a single paranormal experience and being a biomedical engineer, a career so grounded in both medical science and mathematics, she thought it was all a bunch of nonsense. I, on the other hand, had a few experiences growing up. My old Queen Anne style childhood home was definitely haunted. Several of us saw the figure of an old woman in the hallway outside my parents' bedroom. We heard she was killed there. Never found proof of that, but we believed it. And we definitely all saw the same apparition, looking the same, showing up in the same place several times. And I've had a few other experiences as well. The first time I saw those shadows, Angie just laughed. By the end of the night, she even almost had me convinced that maybe I didn't see anything. It was just a trick of light or whatever. But then about a week later, I saw them again. Three little shadows, looking like they were playing together over by the orange trees. And this time, Angie saw them too, even if she wouldn't admit it. It was late in the evening, and they showed up in the same place. This night, however, the moon was much fuller, and it was quite a bit lighter out. So they stood out more, three pitch black shapes, distinctly small human sized. And you could see the outline of their dresses and longer hair, very much the shape of little girls, anywhere from kindergarten to fifth or sixth grade sized. The second I noticed them, I whispered, Angie, by the orange trees, the shadows are back. Oh, come on. You can't be. Uh, Oh, oh, that's really weird. What is that? Baby, I think we're looking at three ghosts. No, it, it, it can't be. Angie looked up into some of the large oaks on her property, trying to find a a natural source for the shadows. I looked up too, but there was nothing. When we looked back, they were gone. You really still don't believe in any of that stuff? I really don't, she said. Then how do you explain what we just both saw? You talking about them all week clearly got into my head, she told me. She wasn't ready to be convinced, not yet. But then the dream started. The first time she had one, she still wouldn't admit to what was going on, but she'd come around soon enough. I dreamt we were on our property, but a long time ago. The old original house was still standing, and a family of five lived there. A mother, a father, and three young girls. Everyone was happy. The dad chased the girls around the fruit trees, playing some sort of game while the mom watched them, smiling, working in the garden. But then suddenly, time jumping around like it does sometimes in dreams, the dad was gone and all the joy in the family had left with him. And something was wrong with the mom. She seemed especially depressed, and the girl seemed concerned, anxious, afraid of her. She just sat on the porch and stared off into the distance. The girls kind of played a game, but clearly weren't having any fun, just going through the motions, and they were keeping their eyes on their mother. And that was it. I woke up. I told Angie about it the following morning, and just for a moment, I saw a flicker of recognition in her eyes. I'd soon find out she had just had that same dream, that exact same dream. A few nights later, I had the dream again, and now Angie will confess that she did as well. She said she didn't tell me after the first time because she hoped it was a one-time thing and didn't want to fuel my obsession with the shadow girls we'd seen. We both now connected those shadows to our dreams, but Angie still wasn't ready to fully admit the connection was supernatural. She wanted to believe that me seeing some odd shadows, thinking they were the ghosts of little girls, led to her also interpreting normal shadows as being girls the second time when we both saw them, and then that led to us having the exact same dream. But having the exact same dream two separate nights at the same time? She'd never heard of that before. She still told me she was going to file it all under coincidence, but she had to admit it was a very strange coincidence. The third time it happened, though, which was the very next night, now she knew something outside the realm of science was going on. She still wouldn't use the word ghost, but she knew something 
very unusual was occurring, something outside the realm of coincidence. The dream had now shifted. It started out the same, everyone happy, the dad chasing the girls around the fruit trees, mom watching them all from the garden, time jumping forward, the dad's gone, the mom's depressed, the girls are anxious, time jumps forward again, now the girls are huddled together near the orange trees and the mother is screaming at them and she looks very unwell. She'd lost a lot of weight, dark circles under her eyes. She was holding a big wooden mixing spoon in her hand, heading towards the girls. She raised it, about to strike one of them when I woke up. I sat up in bed and my heart was racing. And at the exact same time, Angie woke up. I knew immediately what had happened. I quickly shared the details of my dream, stared at Angie the whole time. I relayed everything. Her eyes widened. Halfway through, she said, what the fuck is happening? When I finished, I felt a powerful urge to go outside and just look towards the orange trees. I knew those shadows would be there. I made Angie come with me, and she squeezed my hand hard the moment we both saw them. Felix, what is this? Who are they? There were those three shadows again, not circling around this time, though. It looked like they were all holding hands, standing still, and silently staring back at us. We both felt the most powerful sense of fear and sadness while we watched them watch us. We both got the chills, felt our hair stand up on our arms, and had tears well up in our eyes before the figures vanished. I, I don't know, I said back, but I think they're trying to tell us something. The following morning, before heading out to work, I walked over to where we'd seen the girls and the air felt different, like static electricity. I walked back towards the airstream, the feeling went away. Walked back towards the trees, felt it again. What was happening? We'd get our big clue that same night, another dream, a nightmare this time. The first mental snapshots were the same as before, but now instead of waking up when the mother went to hit one of her girls with a spoon, I watched the strike land, and then another, and another. The mother was swinging wildly while the oldest girl tried to shield the younger two from the blows. Then the mother fell to her knees, sobbing, and the girls huddled together away from her, crying. It was so sad. Time jumped ahead again, and it was much worse. It was the middle of the night. The mother walked out of the front door, carrying one of the girls limp in her arms. She walked over to a spot near the orange trees and laid the body down. Then she walked back into the house. She looked like a zombie, her moves robotic. I could feel so much pain and sorrow wafting off of her. She came out of the house again with another limp body in her arms. She laid it next to the first, then walked into the house a final time before coming out with the third girl. After laying her body next to the other two, all of them completely still, she walked behind the house and then returned with the shovel. That was when I woke up. Angie was still sleeping, but she was making terrible sounds and writhing her body around like someone having a nightmare. I shook her awake and she screamed. It startled me so badly, I actually fell off of the bed. When I popped back up, Angie was sobbing. I didn't even need to ask her now. I knew she had had the same nightmare, which she told me later she did. At that time, I just held her for a bit. And then once she'd calmed down some, I told her I felt like I needed to go over to those trees. She wouldn't come with me. She told me she didn't want to see anything else. The whole thing was really starting to scare her. And now she was starting to worry that our life in what was supposed to be a dream house was going to be a disaster. I left the airstream and walked outside. I looked but couldn't see any shadowy figures by the orange trees. I walked over in the dark and felt that electric charge in the air again. After standing there for a few minutes, I turned to head back into the airstream. Ah! I let out a scream as the shadowy figure of the mother from my dreams stood before me. As clearly as a real living person speaking to me, I heard her in my mind say, please give them peace. I'm sorry. And then she was gone. And spontaneously, I started sobbing now. I felt insane. It was the most intense, powerful, overwhelming feeling of sorrow I'd ever experienced by far. I knew what I needed to do now. I told Angie what happened, what we needed to do, and we stayed awake until the morning. It was a Saturday morning and one of the subcontractors working on our place came over early to work. We didn't have a shovel yet, but he did. He let me borrow it. He warned me not to dig around the orange trees before calling 811 in case there was a buried power line or something, but he also didn't think there would be anything. I took my chances. The tree roots made it rough in a few moments, but overall the soil was pretty soft and easy to dig down into. While Angie stayed inside, I dug and dug and dug. And after about 90 minutes, I hit something. Bone. Human bone. I grabbed a trowel or some uh, of some sort the contractor had and used that to dig around the bone and quickly uncovered more bones. That's when I stopped and called the police. I'll summarize the rest as quickly as I can. A forensic team ended up digging up the remains of three girls under that orange tree, buried decades earlier in a shallow grave. 
Through dental records, their identities were determined. They used to live on the property. They'd gone missing back in the 50s when their mother also disappeared. Their father worked at a factory of some sort in Santa Monica and had died months earlier in an accident. And the mom, widowed and in a bad financial situation, went mad with grief. She left the area, ended up taking her own life in Texas about a year later. No one knew all of this back in the 50s. They didn't know where she went or what happened to the girls. Now it was clear that she had very likely killed them. The police said, very likely, Angie and I knew for sure she did. We practically saw it happen. The police were a bit shocked by uh, why I decided to dig where I did, but also not suspicious of me. I wasn't even alive when the girls were killed. Once their remains were identified, I asked if we could pay to bury them next to their father. To the officer's credit, they helped me locate his grave in Santa Monica in the Woodland Memorial Cemetery, and we were able to bury them in the same plot as their father. Had a proper burial ceremony and everything. After that, we never had any more strange dreams about the girls or ever saw their shadows again. But now, our daughters see them. We have two girls of our own, and Bella, our oldest, who is four, has told us on numerous occasions when we've heard her talking while it seems like she's playing alone that she's with her friends. And when Angie and I have asked how many friends she has, she always says three. Three sisters. Three sisters who used to live where we live. But now they're in heaven most of the time, but sometimes they stop by to play with her. When we've asked if they scare her, she tells us no. She says they're nice. And that they love her, her sister, and her mommy and her daddy. Good enough for us to leave it all alone for now. Our home in Topanga really did end up being the dream, a dream. It never felt uh, a really... Our home in Topanga really did end up being the dream we thought it would be. It's never felt dark or dreary or sad or unsafe. California really is a magical and enchanted place, more magical and enchanted than I ever expected. Damn. Ugh. I knew as soon as you said that they had daughters, yeah. I was like, oh no. Oh no. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy that like, I mean, that's actually very noble to then yeah. like pay for the burial. Mm -hmm. And I would like to believe that if I, if we solved some long yeah. murder, mystery, missing child thing that we yeah. would- do, do that. something like that. Yeah. yeah. If you can do it. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, yeah. There's no family and, you know, cetera, absolutely. Cetera, yeah. Mm. Uh, no pics associated with that story. Oh, but uh, you're going to show us to ping a kid. I am. I am. Dan? Here's a pic of an old house uh, where Neil Young <laughs> used to live. I think he recorded parts of uh, something. Oh, man. Gold Moon. It's, it's, the, it's the album with like, Young man, take a look at my life. I'm alive. Like Favorite song of all time. Oh, yeah. Really? That's right. That's right. Tyler does love that song. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that song, Tyler, was recorded in the basement of that place. Uh, this next one's a view of the Topanga State Park. So it is just like so cool, like the mountains That's there. It's beautiful. The, I can't believe you've never been there. Yeah, this next one, an ocean view from some house in Topanga. It's just cool that you could like look out and towards that uh, mm -hmm. that island. I can't think of what it's called right Catalina. now. Catalina. Catalina, thank you. Fucking Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> oh, yeah. I haven't been there either. And then this last one, photo of- I actually have never been to Catalina either, which is Someday. really pathetic. I lived there for 10 years yeah. and never went. This last one, a photo of Woodland Memorial Cemetery in Santa Monica. It's actually really big, a uh, pretty old cemetery, and I might have to look for some stories set in it. Actually, I never went there when we were living there. You never went? Did you ever go to Woodland Hills? Yes. Okay. Because I had an accountant there. Okay, wait. Todd Chella, I think, was in Topanga Canyon. Oh, really? Uh huh. I'm almost uh, certain. Our uh, friend, our friend Todd, was known for having these epic birthday parties before he was married, and like is on the path that he's on now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, oh my God, the um, the record company yeah played his 40th birthday, but right. like, but, but like, like before they were who they are uh -huh. now. Like he was just like a huge fan. He was always like a festival guy, mm -hmm. whatever. And I. It was in Woodland Hills if it wasn't in Topanga Canyon. Yeah, I don't know. Because there's also that giant mall in Woodland Hills. And that's why mm. I know Topanga Canyon is because having literally been a professional shopper, you'd have yeah. to go to every mall within like a, I don't know, a hundred mile radius of Los Angeles. And so. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But yeah, Topanga Canyon is so cool. So cool. I would like to see it in the day because I, well, I drove through I've it. I've shot there before. I drove through it. Terrible time to drive. I, I shouldn't have. But I just remember thinking like, oh, this would be cool. Because I was driving from one podcast to another. Wait, like what cities were you going from? I was from? going from Woodland Hills, a podcast there. Well, with Whitney. Oh, yeah. I'll talk about later. So like Whitney Cummins podcast to, to Annie Letterman's podcast, and she's in Venice. Oh, yeah. And so I was like, oh, this would be cool. But I, I wasn't thinking it was dark. I can afford to live in Venice. It is so expensive now. Yeah. Yeah, it was dark, and it was uh, pouring rain, and that road is so windy. Yeah. That I was like, it was not good. I was, no. The visibility was like terrible, but I just remember thinking like, I got to come back here sometime in the day. 
Remember when we were in Seattle for my birthday a couple of years ago and it was pouring rain and I was losing my mind driving? Mm -hmm. I, I, I like made everyone, I was like, everyone shut up. Yeah. And I just, <laughs> it, it, that like dark rain, Oof, yeah. windy roads, terrible combo. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome to Topanga Canyon, Dan. Yeah. I'm glad that you liked it. I, I wondered, I had wrote down very early in the, when they started to have the dreams, like, mm -hmm. was it going to be like a flashbacky, premonition-y yeah. kind of uh -huh. like storytelling? And I, I knew as soon as you said the three girls, I wrote down the first thing when you're talking about them around the tree, mm -hmm. cemetery question mark, orange tree. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. they were, I knew they were buried there. I knew it. And also I love you so much, baby. Yeah. What I do. I am not living in a trailer with you for an extended period of time. Oh, uh, yeah. It's pretty tight quarters. Pretty tight. Yeah. Pretty tight. Not Cheers. even an Airstream. Airstreams are amazing. They're pretty cool. They are. Just small, though. But it's still yeah, we're, small. We're right up on each other. Dan's a big person. We have two dogs that are very clingy. <laughs> and yeah. it, like I already get sweated out of my own bed at night. Mm -hmm. And I keep we keep the temperature in the house at 67 overnight, sometimes 66. Mm -hmm. And I'm still waking up just like ripping things off. <laughs> <laughs> so I just imagine like trailer life, not great for me. Not, not like a month. Okay. But yeah. for 18 months while we build a house, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think so, bro. Here's the deal. If we can't afford to live in a house while we build a house, we're never building a house. Okay. Okay. That seems fair. <laughs> so I guess Dan and Lindsay are never building a house. <laughs> oh, those are great stories. Thank you. I love them both. Yeah, I feel I very too. refreshed. Me too. Yeah. Sleep is good. Mm -hmm. I, love I know. Sleep. I know. I went. I'm feeling good today. I went from having, and this is why, like, the road and this type of podcasting is challenging. Why I'm looking forward to just like a recharge break. Yeah, I'm so excited for next year. Yeah, because like you know, Providence so fun. By the way, I had so much fun with people in Providence. Um, yeah, I saw that you met some fan. Yeah, I met some fans. Yep. Don't worry, guys. I wasn't jealous at all. <laughs> and then, but like you know, Saturday night after the second show, just because we live like in this corner of the country to get home, you either have to take a really early flight or like really late. Yeah. And I usually go early so I can at least get home a little bit more. But I had to go from, you know, I make it back to the hotel about like one in the morning after getting squared up with, uh, you know, getting paid, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then I have to get up at four to get uh, to the airport. Oh, yeah. And I, then I can't sleep very well if I only have a three-hour window because I'm like, I don't want to miss it. Right. It's just a small nap. So it's a little nap. And then if I'm too tired on the on the first flight, I am too uncomfortable to sleep. Right. And then, so I, when I got, I was a zombie when I got home yesterday. You did really good. You came home and had an hour long conversation with me in which you were entirely engaged. It was yeah. impressive. I, I, I worked and then I drank a, a big mocha and I got like work done until about like six. It's like on a Sunday. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, I just need to eat a big meal. Uh huh. Shepherd's and just, pie. Here we <laughs> shepherd's pie, ice cream. I'm like, I'm going to carve up and just knock myself out. Weed gummy. And then I slept for 11 hours. And it was really cute. You were out. Yeah. Now I feel okay. Cute, like a human. Human. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also like in Providence, like you didn't get to take a shower because there was a problem with the water. Yeah. The building was, uh, <laughs> oh my God. It really, just before we go into the last thing, I've never heard of this concept in a hotel before. Old building downtown, 18 stories mm -hmm. <laughs> and the hallway. Don't so, name the hotel. I won't. Okay. So my room um, was, you know, the temperature worked fine. And then, but then, but then I would walk into the hallway. So I'd be like 68, 69 degrees in my room, walk out of the hallway. It felt like a hundred degrees, not joking. It was like so hot. I'm like, at first I'm like, am I sick? Like what's going on? And then, and then I got into the elevator, go down to the ground floor and it was kind of cold out and it was like 50, 60, it was freezing yeah. in the lobby. I'm like, what is going on? So finally I tell somebody else in the lobby, I'm like, Hey, is your hallway on your floor in Inferno? I didn't realize that he worked there. And he goes, yeah. oh, you're on the third or fourth floor, right? And I was like, yeah, fourth floor. He goes, the heating isn't working on any of the other floors. So their solution to try to warm up the building was to max the heat to an unbearable level on two floors, hoping it would filter up to the rest of the floors. Which is not a good plan. No, I don't think it works that way. I know. I'm like, now thinking about this, you had a really bad- the Heat rises, but like, huh. Nah, I, but like not that. Yeah. Yeah, to that degree. Uh like between the water and the heat and the bad check-in. Oh, yeah. I do feel like we should get some sort of refund. Like I'm not kind of, I'm not <laughs> that person, but if I felt inclined to be that person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were clearly having hot water tank problems too because you, uh, only one day out of three was I able to get the hot water working. <laughs> so, it's like, I didn't, yeah. Whatever. I am so glad I didn't go to Providence. Uh-huh. Um, okay. Well, before I dive into my stories, yes. I have a mid-show announcement. Don't go anywhere. <gasps> say it's a giving say. tree it's a giving tree it's a giving tree so dan and i understand that at the beginning of the show you just want to like dive right in we get it and we're working with the 
layout of the show a little bit. And this particular month, I, I know that you guys always hear our charity announcements, but this one is especially important. So I just want to remind everybody who's listening that this month, in the month of December, we are doing, once again, the annual Bad Magic Giving Tree that Dan and I have hosted. This is now the fourth or fifth year. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so by the time you hear this, the 30 families that were able to help will have already applied and have been selected. But what's cool about this giving tree, in case you haven't been a part of this in the past, is that we take the Patreon donation, which will be somewhere between $12,000 and $14,000 this month. And then we also ask the fans if they want to contribute because in years past they have. So Amazon gift cards is how we do this. We handle all of the shipping, everything. We do all the shopping but we ask if you can skip your mocha this week. You know, that's a $9 drink. Like if you can afford to not do that and send us a $10 Amazon gift card, those gift cards add up really fast. We have some incredibly generous fans who have sent in 200, 500. This morning I got a $1,000 donation, insane, which yeah. is fucking incredible. We understand everybody's not in that position. You wouldn't believe. And don't feel guilty at all if you're not no. in a position to do anything. No, exactly. But yeah. like uh, last yeah. year, what we found out is people were like, oh, I didn't know you were doing that. Yep. I would have liked to. So we're just sharing this mid-show before I tell my story in case you fast forward through the yeah. announcements, which we, which also we get. totally get. <laughs> uh, we do the same thing. And um, <laughs> yeah, and if you would like to send a gift card, just know that Dan and I are matching every dollar that's donated up to $13,000. So theoretically, we could have about 13 from Patreon, 13 from the fans, and 13 from Dan and Lindsay, and we will make this an epic giving tree. Yeah. If you'd like to do that, just go to Amazon, buy an Amazon gift card specifically, and the recipient address is givingtree2023 at badmagicproductions.com. Okay. Cool. You ready for some horror? Let's do it. Let's do it. You got Layla over there? I, I do. Know. I got my traditional one again. I know. I put I put baby Baphomet front and center, and I'm okay. just- Hi, Boff. <laughs> All right. I have one awesome haunted house story for you this week. The house on Westchester. When I was 15, my parents had gotten divorced. It was a tough time to watch the world around me collapse. Just starting my freshman year of high school, things were not looking very positive. My father had just ejected my mother out of the first home we'd moved into three years before in Colorado. After that happened, my mother moved into an apartment across the street from my school, giving me a place to go see her once school let out. Only several months after that, my mother recognized that that was not going to be a good option for her. She never even furnished the apartment outside of her bed, a desktop, a desktop computer, and a chair. I guess at that point, my mother had had enough, living in a space that never really felt like home. So she moved out of that apartment and into a house that was available for rent several blocks from my father's, and that is where the story begins. The house on Westchester was a gorgeous home, two large French doors to enter, a wide living room, a spacious kitchen, a lower level family room. The only hitch in the process was that the house had been vacant and the property unkept for two years, not even maintained by the property owner. The property owner never actually came to the house that much. Uh, that much I remember. I never met her. I only heard about her. And now, as an adult, those few things seem very unsettling to me. If I was that tenant, I would have seen those experiences as a red flag. Why wouldn't the property owner maintain a vacant lot for two years? I can only assume my mother had that same feeling, but she was on her last choice of places to move into, and so she took it. I fondly remember the first day we arrived. We pulled up to what looked like an abandoned house on a corner lot. The exterior of the structure was intact. There wasn't any graffiti or paneling removed. But what gave it away was the two and a half feet of uncut grass and weeds all around the property. I should have known that this wasn't my mother's first choice when she feigned excitement of moving in. I distinctly remember the smell of the house when we entered. The door creaked as it opened. And as we stepped in, we were taken aback by the intense scent of dust and muskiness. It wasn't like it was the scent of the death of a human, but it was the scent of the death of a house. Dust blanketed the walls, the countertops, the handrails, the untuned, lonely piano against the wall to our left. Only after accepting the smell did we enter. We began to turn on the lights and make our way through the house. There was a half staircase of maybe five or six stairs on the left that led to an almost claustrophobically tight hallway. In that hallway was a bathroom to the left and a bedroom on the right. That bedroom was taken by my oldest brother, who was 19 at the time and prepping to ship off to Navy boot camp. My other brother specifically requested the basement bedroom, which he'd not even looked at yet. The upstairs hallway continued from the bathroom, turned a sharp left with a door all the way at the end of the hallway. That was the master bedroom and, of course, my mother's room. 
There was a hard wood floored room that came off the same hallway that was decided to be the study. But at the initial turn, there was a door that led into a third room. This room was appointed to me. As the door opened, more dust and musk caressed our noses as we looked up upon a partially furnished room. Directly ahead of me was a canopy bed, queen-sized and mattressless. To my right of that, at the end of the room, was a long, waist-level dresser, and to the right of that, a wardrobe, kitty corner to the closet. As we chose rooms, we began to clean the inside of the house and get the house to a livable condition. My brothers and mother began to move in our furniture, while my job was to mow the yard. I did not realize the sheer size of the yard until I started to mow it. I made several passes from one end of the yard to the other— and then I began to feel a sharp pain radiating from my right calf. It continued to increase with intensity with every step I took, consuming my very motor function until I stopped. I quickly released the lawnmower and started to roll up my pant leg. The pain was excruciating. As I rolled up my pant leg, my leg was covered in a black and yellow color that only after looking at it for several seconds did I realize was hundreds of yellow jackets. Through the pain, I was able to frantically swipe the wasps from my leg and observe the reddened flesh. I could feel tears of pain running down my face as my eyes caught the giant hole only several feet behind me where the yellow jackets were now swarming. I had disrupted their hive by running over it with the lawnmower. I quickly went back into the house, limping down the second set of stairs and into the garage where I scoured the many boxes and shelves for wasp spray. There it was on the shelf, an unopened can of long-distance wasp spray. Now I could get my revenge on that hive. I walked out of the garage, through the house, and back out to the yard, making my way back to the mower. I walked to where the hole was, but when I got there, there was no hole and there were no wasps. Did I merely imagine it, I thought? I didn't. My leg was still burning, and I rolled up my pant leg again to see that there were still red marks all over my calf. I looked around for the hole one more time, but I never did find it. As I continued to mow the lawn once again, my mother and brothers returned to the moving truck and began to move boxes and furniture into the house. Mowing the lawn took the rest of the day, and as the sun began to set, I made my way into the house. As my mom turned on the lights in the house to illuminate all the work they did, the house came to life. The house looked immaculate, clean, like a home. Little did we know, this was probably the moment that the house actually did come to life. Things were normal for the first couple of months. The first unusual thing that started to happen about three months in was that the television in the living room would turn on in the middle of the night. At first, we thought it was faulty wiring or something along those lines, causing the TV to turn on. The weird thing about it was that when the TV would turn on, it wouldn't turn on to the channel we had left it on. It would always turn on to static. When it first started happening, the TV was almost silent. I would wake up and faintly make out the sound of static. But as time went on, the television continued to turn on in the middle of the night. But the more it did, the louder it became. Until one night, it turned turned on so blaringly loud it woke me up. It didn't wake my mother up, though. She used to sleep with a large fan on, loud enough to keep the other things going on in the house from waking her. I went downstairs to turn the TV off, and as I made my way back to my bedroom, I passed the bathroom. The door was open, the light was off, and then suddenly the toilet flushed, scaring the shit out of me. I quickly reached my hand to the bathroom and turned the light on to see who was there, but no one was. Confused, I turned the light off and returned to my room. The next couple of nights, the TV would turn on as usual and then the toilet would flush as I would return to my room. And then one night, I finally remember an evening I was home alone. My mother was out of family friends and my brothers were out doing God knows what. I was in the living room watching TV into the late hours of the night. When I was done, I unplugged the TV. I didn't want to be woken up in the middle of the night again. I hadn't slept all week in the first place. I walked up the stairs around the corner and into the hallway towards my room. I walked into my room and I lied down to go to sleep. And later that evening, I was woken by the sound of static from the TV in the living room. Frustrated, I flung the covers off, looked at my clock on the dresser next to me on the large wooden TV in my bedroom. It illuminated 3 a.m. I walked downstairs around the corner and saw that the TV was in fact on. I walked down the second flight of stairs towards the TV and I looked behind it to see if it was still unplugged. And it was. And it was at that moment I realized these weren't just random things happening in our house. This was the night I finally comprehended we weren't the only people living in this house. I quickly turned off the TV and made my way back upstairs. And as I walked up the steps to the kitchen area where our dining table was, one of the six wooden chairs swung out from underneath the table by itself. 
I paused only for a moment and watched as the other five chairs then swung out from under the table. I jumped and ran quickly back to my room, closing the door behind me. I, I lied down in bed, quietly staring at the ceiling. I then started to hear footsteps in the hallway, and then the toilet flushed. There was no light coming from the hallway. I knew it wasn't my brother coming home. The footsteps got closer and closer to my room, getting heavier as they approached my bedroom door. I pulled my blanket up over my head, shut my eyes as I heard the knob on my door begin to twist. The lock clicked and the door creaked as it opened slowly. I crunched my eyes shut tight until I felt slight movement above my blanket. Not like it was being pulled at or grabbed, but it was moving ever so slightly. I could hear it. It was the sound of heavy breathing, labored breaths. I tightened my grip on my blanket, never wavering with my grasp, and then it stopped. Silence fell over the house once again, and I somehow fell asleep. I awoke the next morning, blanket still over my head, and as I pulled it down, I noticed something was different in my room. I leaned forward and looked at the dresser at the far side of my room. My TV, a very heavy wooden tube TV, I was incapable of moving by myself, was no longer on the left side of my dresser. It was now on the right side of my dresser. Mm. My alarm clock was on the floor. The wardrobe doors were swung wide open and my clothes that were once inside were now all over the floor. I quickly got out of bed and began to clean up. I told my mother about it, and like any skeptic, she didn't believe me. Of course, being an angsty, angry teenager from a now broken home didn't help. After that night, things settled down. The TV turning on in the middle of the night continued, but I wasn't visited again. And then things went back to normal. I did my research, or as much as I could, googling the address, but found nothing. So I gave up looking for further information. My mother had been breeding the two Yorkies she had, and the mom was getting close to giving birth. One night, I was in the living room with my girlfriend of the time, when we heard it. It was a faint whining sound. And then it dawned on me, Sassy had given birth. I quickly stood up and ran to where she was and I could see it. She was nursing her three newborn pups. I was fascinated by the sight of a dog that had never given birth before, instinctually knowing how to bite the cord and clean her puppies. It was a marvel. But then things took a sour turn. It was only a couple days after she gave birth that tragedy struck the puppies. I came home from school and my mom was in the kitchen, sadness apparent on her face. One of the puppies had died. It was sad, but there were still two alive and well. Until the next day, I came home from school to hear a whining coming from Sassy in the study, and I quickly ran up to find her licking one of the two puppies as the other nursed. I knelt down and studied the one she was licking. It was lying there, immobile. I reached down and picked it up. I held it, looking at its, stopping, looking at its stomach, hoping to see it breathe, but it did not. It had died, and I was heartbroken. I told my mom when she got home and she took the puppy to the vet. The vet told her he couldn't find a single cause of death. Nothing jumped out at him. The healthy puppies had been healthy until they died. He assumed that they had some canine form of SIDS. My mom had uh, was content with this answer, but I never was. Two out of three puppies die, and after the second one died, things started to escalate in our house again. The footsteps outside my bedroom returned. The TV would turn on more than once night, and every time I would go downstairs, the chairs that were usually tucked neatly under the kitchen table were in disarray. We only had a couple more days before we moved out of this house, and I feel like the house knew it. This night was different than all the others. I once again watching TV into the late hours of the evening when in the midst of watching TV, the TV turned itself off. I turned it back on again, thinking the house or the TV had lost power for a split second, but then a couple moments passed and the TV turned off again. I turned the TV on. Only seconds later, it turned itself off. I decided to just go to bed. But as I exited the room, the TV turned on again, and this time at full volume. The static was almost deafening. I quickly ran over to the TV and unplugged it. I turned around to then watch the kitchen chair quickly screech across the hardwood floor. I freaked out and ran up the stairs, rounded the corner, and of course, as I passed the bathroom, the toilet flushed. I quickly ran into my room and climbed into bed. I lied back and stared at the ceiling. The moon was full that night, shining directly in through my bedroom window, illuminating the popcorn ceilings. I strained my eyes until I could make out what I was seeing. A five-pointed star with a cross in the center was clearly visible as if the design had been stenciled onto the ceiling and then spackle was sprayed over it. As I concentrated on the ceiling, I heard it. The footsteps in the hallway were back. The toilet flushed once again and I could hear the chain in the kitchen, the chair in the kitchen screech across the floor. I quickly ran to the door and opened it, hoping to identify this apparition. But there was nothing there. Everything had stopped. It was dead silent. The house didn't creak. The wind didn't blow. I never knew how loud silence could be until this moment. Something in the back of my mind told me I shouldn't be hearing silence. I should hear 
something. I stepped back into my room, closed the door. As the lock clicked into place, a loud bang rang, rang out and the door to my bedroom shook violently as if someone had struck it with their fists in a fit of rage. I jumped into bed and pretended to be asleep and then my door opened. It creaked slowly. I didn't want to look, but I did. All, I didn't want to look, but I also did, all at the same time. I brought myself to turn my head towards the doorway and that's when I saw it. A towering black shadow that ducked to bring its head under the doorway approaching my bed. I felt fear trickle from my neck to my tips of my fingers to my toes. I was frozen still, heart beating out of my chest as the shadow approached my bed. He stopped. I could feel him looking at me. There were no details in his face to tell me what he was. I could just feel he was looking at me. His breathing intensified loud enough for me to hear it, heavy enough for me to feel it. I was defenseless, a scared child in a blanket. And even in the dark, I was able to see the apparition change his gaze from me to the ceiling, staring directly at the space in which I could still see the five-pointed star. I heard him take in a large breath and let out a heavy grunt. And then I heard the garage door open. The man stood there still staring down at me. As my mother entered the house, she began to turn on the lights and the apparition disappeared. When my mother turned on the light in the hallway, the symbol on the ceiling disappeared as well. My mother, confused as to why my door was open, came in and I told her what happened. She told me she had just closed on a house and we could start moving our stuff out the next day. The next day, I googled the symbol on the ceiling and I found that it was this, it was a star, uh, it was a pentagram pentacle uh, used to signify the five puncture rooms of Jesus Christ as he had hung on the cross. Articles that I found stated that the combination of the symbols, the pentagram and the cross, was used as a protection in several Celtic pagan circles. I have thought back on that night many times, wondering if that symbol that was on my ceiling kept the apparition from crossing the threshold into our world and being able to touch me. Uh, that, uh, that thought stayed with me for many years. And when I turned 18, I got that symbol tattooed on my left forearm. And mm -hmm. to this day, the man has never visited me again. Whoa. I, I, one of the things I wrote down in on my hand was that um, pentagram with a cross in it. I'm uh -huh. like... I'm like, was it supposed to be an upside down cross? I, I didn't realize that was actually a, a protection symbol. I didn't either. In like Celtic, like mythology or, or Celtic, whatever. Pagan mm -hmm. ritual. Yeah. I mean, I guess it would be Christian Pag stuff too, I'm yeah. thinking. Uh, but yeah, but in that yeah. like belief form. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that either. I, I wrote down something else. Uh, well, one, yellow jackets. I hate yellow jackets so much. Oh, they're so brutal. That thing, I could just picture that. I could imagine that so strongly. Like, the, just the way they bite you and swarm on you. I was like, ugh, I hate those things. Do you remember when you set yellow jackets on fire in our backyard? Oh, oh, that's right. Monroe, like, we have this, like, weird, like, egress window situation. And, like, a football or a soccer ball or something went down there. And Monroe went down to get it. And, like, this had happened multiple times. And she was bitching about it every time she had to go down there. Mm -hmm. And then she came up, like, crying. And we were uh -huh. like, oh, Monroe, shut up. Like, yeah. Stop. She's like, oh, so in my leg. And she had gotten bit a few uh. times. And then in, oh, yeah. in true fatherly rage, nothing was going to hurt his precious baby girl. So he lit it on fire. There's not, video of it Not just lit it on fire. I almost, we were worried for a second about burning the house down because, um, and I, I wasn't going to I talked about this on Is We Dumb when we first, I remember, I'm like, oh yeah, that was one of the first uh, things I talked uh, about because it timed that way where I got a bunch of gasoline, like lawnmower gas dumped it all over that entire area, like walked down there, poured uh -huh. it all over them and then flicked a match down there and just woof. And then you could see like them on fire trying to fly out of it for a second. I'm like, yeah, die, die yellow jackets. Also almost burn our house down. True. It was exciting. Then I was like, oh shit, that fire is pretty big. <laughs> uh, I think it's on your social media. It might be. Yeah, it might be it if funny. I dig back far enough. And then I also wrote down, I have the weirdest things on my hand here, sure. but um, should have grabbed a piece of paper. But toilet, that little detail... I can't think of another story we've come across where the toilet spontaneously flushes. That alone, I have never had that happen ever in my life, and there's no reason for it to happen naturally. Like, like, right. like unless you had a motion detector, which you, I've never seen somebody have one of those in their homes. Yeah. But like, if, if it was one at the airport spontaneously going off. Oh, or oh, a public, those. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah, yeah, that yeah, can yeah. malfunction. That can malfunction. There's something... Um, it doesn't have to be a physical push of something to flush right, it. Right, 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 right. But a home toilet where you have to press the handle down to make it flush, there is absolutely no reason for that to ever happen on its own that I know of that wouldn't be supernatural. You know, there are home toilets now where it's like you can just like wave over the top of the tank. Yeah, so in that situation, okay. Oh, I don't know. That somehow also feels like equally as creepy to me because it's mm -hmm. like, then I'm thinking of like something ethereal, like floating above it. But but if that but if it happened on one of those toilets, I would rationalize it. Where if it happened yeah. like on our traditional toilets at home, yeah, no, thank you. 
I know. That is a weird. I mean, and there were other things in that story, like the chairs all of a sudden coming out that are like more freaky. Mm-hmm. But just, I was like, oh yeah, sometimes I like to think about just like the little details where that one thing happening at our house. And she talked about, or I said she, she but maybe. Oh, well, I don't know if the gender was ever assigned. No, I don't think <laughs> Okay, gen- so the person, whoever they are, they mentioned it um, I think I actually, multiple I th- times. I think. The toilets. Uh, it is a gentleman. Well, oh, I'm assuming okay. he uh, pronouns, but. I'm- oh, okay. Uh, but, but if that, but like, again, like multiple times, I'm like, I don't know how else you would rationalize that. Obviously, yeah. in the context of that story, there's other things going on. Right. But if but only even just that, that, that's enough. Yep. If we had our uh, every, you know, feels a little weird and then the toilet goes off by itself a couple of times, that sucks. Can we move? No. We live with the fear. You say that now because it's <laughs> yeah. daytime and you're well rested. True. I don't know. I don't know how it would affect me if it really happened. Ugh. I was trying to think. I feel like something happened while I was home alone this past week. And now I can't remember. So it must not have been that big of a deal but it was definitely a moment where i was like oh i did not like that mm-hmm. just something that like made my heart race oh i know what it was i had gone to dinner with a friend of ours on saturday senior citizen dinner at five o'clock nice. my favorite thing ever and i was wearing my eyeglasses i didn't have my contacts in and i was driving and the streets in Coeur it makes me so crazy how there's like <laughs> Like the, um, yeah. what are you laughing at? Sorry, I don't know why I just thought struck me as funny, but the, like the whole motion you did, like, and then you actually said the full word of eyeglasses. Like, and I was wearing my eyeglasses as if that's an unusual thing for people to do. And you got to make sure that they know it's eyeglasses and not just wearing like a random piece of glass. Or, and that it was definitely on your face for your eyes. I, w- I would have just said I was wearing my glasses, but you did the uh, hand motion. I was wearing my eyeglasses. Uh-huh. I was wearing Be- my eyeglasses. Well, because, okay, let me tell you why. Because I did like a physical motion in the car mm-hmm. while I was driving. Uh-huh. It's so obnoxious, like the off the main, off the main drag, you know, there's all these little side streets, but they're not four-way stops. So right. Sometimes there's no stop signs. Yeah. Sometimes there's only two. And it's like, you just don't know. It's yeah. it's very unsafe actually. And mm-hmm. late at night and I was wearing my eyeglasses mm-hmm. and I like got to an intersection and something like. Out of the corner of your eyeglasses. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something and I was like, I took my glasses off. Mm-hmm. I wiped them. I my heart, I had to pull over. My heart was racing so hard because I was- Wait, did you wipe your glasses or your eyeglasses? My eyeglasses. Oh, okay. I just got confused for a second in the story. <laughs> You're ruining my scary okay, okay, story. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no keep going, keep it's going. Over. So out of the corner, you see something no, and then you wipe over. your glasses. No, it's over. <laughs> it's oh, over. boy. Well, because it's not going to be scary now. Okay, but what happens? We need resolution. I, I said, I, oh, yeah, you I said saw, you were you too saw. busy in your head about your job. <laughs> I like definitely saw like something. I don't know if it was like leaves falling down from a tree, but mm-hmm. it was just. But when you wear eyeglasses, yeah, it's some like it. It's different than when you have. Well, you don't wear contacts, so you can't mm-hmm. like understand. But like my peripheral. Wait, you wear eye contacts or contacts? Um, I wear butt contacts. <laughs> <laughs> but like when you when you wear contacts, mm-hmm. it. My peripheral vision is perfect. Oh, uh, oh yes. But yes. so when I'm wearing glasses. Obviously, you don't have that same. Yeah, yeah, you don't have the same range of yeah. So yeah, then yeah. I was like, is it just because I'm wearing my glasses? Like, and then things catch the the glass, and it mm-hmm. like can change the reflection. But yeah. it doesn't happen with contacts. I I was like sick to my stomach. I was like, oh my god, did I just see something? Did I just see something? What just happened? And I was like, was it my glasses? Was there did something fall from a tree? Like, I was so fucking yeah. stressed out. I got home, let the dogs out, turned off all the lights in the house, <laughs> oh, man. set the alarm, and went in my bed and was like, oh. I don't like this. I'm pretty confused. Early in the story, you were wearing eyeglasses. And but then towards the <laughs> <laughs> towards the end of the story, those went away and they were just you were working with some kind of glass piece. <laughs> do you know how contacts were <laughs> do you know the initial way that contacts were created? No, actually. Um a pilot, uh I think it was like a navy or mm-hmm. like a like a fire uh, fighter pilot. The it's the dome in those kinds of planes, well, I guess maybe in all planes, but like yeah. it's made of fiberglass and he was in an accident and the, a piece of the fiberglass got into his eye. Ah. No, it was good because then they figured out that that's like how they first started making contacts. They f- really thin pieces of fiberglass. Really? That's what it is? Wow. That, okay. That's yeah, yeah. that's, aye, a, that's an article I read once. That's cool. That was good info. You're welcome. It's for it's for eye contacts. <laughs> for eye contacts, <laughs> not, not for butt contacts or uh, eyeglasses, but for eye, for eye contacts. <laughs> I am picturing a butt contact now. Oh yeah, I knew you would. I where, wanted to take it to butts. Uh huh. Where where it's like um your your brown eye has vision pro- like you're nearsighted <laughs> in your butthole. It can't quite see the toilet, so like you always like miss the toilet so by stupid. a little bit. Oh my god! Get a little monocle down there. 
God, I read it. I was reading this interview with Boris Johnson. This is so random. Mm -hmm. But he referred to throwing up in the toilet as hugging the... Porcelain God? No, 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 no. Hugging... Oh, hugging Ralph, my my big white friend. Because like you, Ralph? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, oh my God, that's so random. I've never heard that. <laughs> I haven't that, either. Is that common amongst uh, British people? <laughs> do you want to do uh, the Annabelle's first or me? Um, You know what, Dan? I'll go first okay. because I have my eye contacts in and I can Good. see really well right now. I would like to thank the following Annabelle's for helping make this month's uh, Bad Magic Giving Tree a possibility. Tabby Lacasio, Taylor Marie, Evan Huey, that one guy, Nate, wait a second. Those are last week's. They didn't get deleted out of this script. Let me try that over. Okay. Matt Flores. There we go. Ducky A. Tracy and Arlene. Mike Oxlong. Kristen Campbell. Zane Cooper. Hector Zeferino. Hector, you have a great last name. I bet it's Zeferno, Zef but I'm going to say Zeferino. <laughs> Storm Flack. Molly Taylor and Kyler Presley. Hey, good name, Kyler. Good job, good job. I'm I'm gonna get these correct the first time because I have because I have my eyeglasses on. Uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelles: the Nordies from Tomble, <laughs> Brianna Long, James Doxtater, Kyle Bevington, Tyler Carney, Kim Messer, D4N1 underscore the Scorpion. Okay, that must yeah. be like a, a handle. A, um, Discord handle. Uh, Christy Anderson, Sweaty Sax, definitely oh. a birth name. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Last name Sachs, first name Sweaty, and then Daniel Sneed. Thank you. You're welcome. Sneed, wasn't there Sneed? Isn't that There's a- There's a comic named Josh Sneed. Maybe that's what you're thinking of it. But isn't- Oh, sh I was thinking of Smee. Mm, Smee. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I just have three spooky shout outs this week. Okay. Uh, to Graham Moo from Cheyenne, Amber, and all of Moo's booze. We love you and thank you for all you do for us. To Jen Jen, aka Don't Call Me Jen Jen, from your mom, Kim- Happy birthday. I see your struggles, but I always have your back and I love you. And to Sabrina from Becky, happy belated birthday to my spooky friend. <laughs> and that is our show, you dirty old tea or perfume tea dogs. <laughs> Thank you for continuing. Maybe to wear eyeglasses. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. Email us for everything else. Info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Tyler C editing, publishing today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander organizing the my story emails. Book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to producer Sarah Finch for finding the first story I told this week. And as I said earlier, I found the second. We are on YouTube if you want to watch us. Boop tube. Boop tube. We're on Facebook and Instagram where uh, we post pics that accompany the stories and more. You can at dig through Dan's socials to find his... The, uh, the hornet burning. Oh my God. Uh, at Scared to Death Podcast is the sh this show's handles. Yeah, Dan Comes Comedy is the one that's going to have Yellow Jackets in it. Uh, we also have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of horror lovers. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. This broad has one, yeah, well, you know. Oof. This broad. What's this broad. It? I should just shut up now. <laughs>